Margaret Fontaine, Dame Margaret Evelyn de Arias de B. Nihukam, 18 May 1921, February 1991, known by the stage name Margaret Fontaine, was an English ballerina. She spent her entire career as a dancer with the Royal Ballet, formerly the Sadler's Wells Theatre Company, eventually being appointed prima ballerina assoluta of the company by Queen Elizabeth Roman II. Beginning ballet lessons at the age of four, she studied in England and China, where her father was transferred for his work. Her training in Shanghai was with George Goncharov, contributing to her continuing interest in Russian ballet. Returning to London at the age of 14, she was invited to join the Vic Wells Ballet School by Ninette de Valois. She succeeded Alicia Markova as prima ballerina of the company in 1935. The Vic Wells choreographer, Sir Frederick Ashton. In 1946, the company, now renamed the Sadler's Wells Ballet, moved into the Royal Opera House at Covent Garden, where Fontaine's most frequent partner throughout the next decade was Michael Summs. Her performance in T. Tchaikovsky's The Sleeping Beauty became a distinguishing role for both Fontaine and the company, but she was also well known for the ballets created by Ashton, including symphonic variations Cinderella, Daphne's and Chloe, Undine and Sylvia. In 1949, she led the company in a tour of the United States and became an international celebrity. Before and after the Second World War, Fontaine performed in televised broadcasts of ballet performances in Britain and in the early 1950s appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show, consequently increasing the popularity of dance in the United States. In 1955, she married the Panamanian politician Roberto Arias and appeared in a live color production of The Sleeping Beauty aired on NBC. Three years later, she and Sums danced for the BBC television adaptation of The Nutcracker. Thanks to her international acclaim and many guest artist requests, the Royal Ballet allowed Fontaine to become a freelance dancer in 1959. In 1961, when Fontaine was considering retirement, Rudolf Nureyev defected from the Kirov Ballet while dancing in Paris. Fontaine, though reluctant to partner with him because of their 19-year age difference, danced with him in his debut with the Royal Ballet in Geisel on 21 February 1962. The duo immediately became an international sensation, each dancer pushing the other to their best performances. They were most noted for their classical performances in works such as Le Corsair Pas de Dieu, Les Sylphides, La Bayadier, Swan Lake, and Raymonda, in which Nurave sometimes adapted choreographies specifically to showcase their talents. The pair premiered Ashton's Marguerite and Armand, which had been choreographed specifically for them, and were noted for their performance in the title roles of Sir Kenneth Macmillan's Romeo and Juliet. The following year, Fontaine's husband was shot during an assassination attempt and became a quadriplegic, requiring constant care for the remainder of his life. In 1972, Fontaine went into semi-retirement, although she continued to dance periodically until the end of the decade. In 1979, she was fated by the Royal Ballet and officially pronounced the prima ballerina assoluta of the company. She retired to Panama, where she spent her time writing books, raising cattle, and caring for her husband. She died from ovarian cancer exactly 29 years after her premiere with Nurave in Geisel. Early Life 1919-1934 Margaret Evelyn Hookham was born on 18 May 1919 in Regate, Surrey, to Hilda Nee Aixen Fonts and Felix John Hookham. Her father was a British mechanical engineer who worked for the British American Tobacco Company. Her mother was the illegitimate daughter of an Irish woman, Evelyn Aixen, and the Brazilian industrialist Antonio Goncalves Fonts. Hookham had one sibling her older brother Felix. 
The family moved to Ealing, where her mother sent her four-year-old daughter with her brother to ballet classes with Grace Bossestow. Her mother accompanied Hookham to her earliest lessons, learning the basic positions alongside her daughter in order to improve her understanding of what a ballet student needed to develop. Over the years, Hilda provided constant support, guidance, and critique to her daughter. She became a well-known backstage presence at Hookham's performances, earning the nickname Black Queen from Hookham's teachers and colleagues. While some children might have balked at such overbearing attention from a parent, Hookham accepted her mother's help with affectionate and unembarrassed naturalness. In July 1924, at the age of five, Hookham danced in a charity concert and received her first newspaper review. The Middlesex Country Times noted that the young dancer had performed a remarkably fine solo which had been vigorously honored by the audience. Even during her early years, Hookham showed signs of the pressure she felt to succeed in her dancing, often pushing herself physically to avoid becoming a disappointment to others. Whenever a dance exam approached, she became ill with a high fever for several days, recovering just in time to take the test. Okam's father began preparing to move his family abroad for work. It was decided, after consultation, that they would take their daughter with them but leave their son Felix at an English boarding school. For Hokam, this new separation from her sibling was a painful experience. Her father was transferred first to Louisville, Kentucky, where Hukem attended school but did not take ballet lessons, as her mother was skeptical about the quality of the local dance school. When Peggy, as she was called in her childhood, was nine, she and her parents moved to China. For about a year, the family lived in Tianjin. This was followed by a brief stint in Hong Kong before they moved to Shanghai in 1931, where Hukem studied ballet with the Russian emigre teacher George Goncharov. Goncharov's partner Vera Volkova later became influential in Hukem's career and training. Hukem had no dreams of becoming a dancer and was a reluctant student, but she was competitive. Having June Brie in her classes pushed her to work harder. She did not like the Sekedi drills, preferring the fluid expression of the Russian style. Her mother brought her back to London when she was 14 to pursue a ballet career. In 1934, Hukam's father wrote from Shanghai, explaining he had been having an affair. He asked his wife for a divorce so that he could marry his new girlfriend. Continuing to work in Shanghai, her father was interned during World War Roman II from 1943 to 1945 by the invading Japanese. After the war, he returned to England with his second wife, Beatrice. Okan began her studies with Serafina Astafieva, but was spotted by Dame Ninette de Valois and invited to join the Vic Wells Ballet School, which would later become the Royal Ballet. She trained under Olga Priabrajinska and Volkova. Her first solo performance occurred in 1933 as an actress rather than a dancer, using the interim name Margit Fonts as a child in the production of The Haunted Ballroom by de Valois. In 1934, she danced as a snowflake in The Nutcracker, still using the name Fonts. Although Hukam's mother had written to her Fonts relatives, requesting their permission for her daughter to use the name for her stage career, the final response was no, possibly due to the family's wish to avoid an association with a theatrical performer. Hilda and her daughter subsequently looked up variations of fonts in the telephone directory, choosing the more British-sounding fontine and adding a twist to make it fontine. The following year, she took the name by which she was known for the remainder of her professional life, Margaret Fontaine, modifying her maternal grandfather's surname. Fonts in Portuguese, font means fountain. In Middle and Modern English until the 16th century, it was spelled Fontaine. Her brother, Felix, who became a specialist of dance photography, 
eventually adopted the same surname. Career. Vic Wells' year is 1935-1945. In 1935, Fontaine had her solo debut, playing young Trigenes in the haunted ballroom. That same year, Sir Frederick Ashton created the role of the bride in his choreography of Stravinsky's Le Baiser de la Fille specifically for her. Though he appreciated her lyric qualities and found her elegant, Ashton said of her early years that Fontaine had brittle stubbornness and lacked polish. In spite of her perceived shortcomings, he cast her as the lead, playing the Creole girl in his production, Rio Grande. When Alicia Markova, the first prima ballerina of the company, left the Vic Wells later in 1935, Fontaine shared the lead with other members of the company, but quickly rose to the top of the field of dancers. That year, she spent her summer holidays in Paris, where she studied with the exiled Russian ballerinas Olga Priabrajinska, Mathilde Kaczynska, and Lubov Igorova. She returned for further studies with them following summers, using Fontaine's delicate and somewhat feline grace to advantage. In 1936, she was cast as the unattainable muse in his apparitions, a role which consolidated her partnership with Robert Helpman, and the same year played a wistful, poverty-stricken flower seller in Nocturne. Her success in Nocturne marked a turning point in Ashton's perception of Fontaine, and he recognized that she could become the heir to Markova as lead dancer for the company. Shortly afterwards, the company began experimenting with televised performances, accepting paid engagements to perform for the BBC at Broadcasting House and Alexandra Palace. Fontaine danced her first televised solo in December 1936, performing the polka from Facade. Although the dancers enjoyed these engagements, the tiny television screens with their unsteady blue pictures meant that the medium was not yet sophisticated enough to become a lucrative avenue for the company. The following year, Fontaine was given the comic role of Julia in a wedding bouquet and was cast with Robert Helpman performing the Pas de Dieu, imitating Victorian ice skaters and Ashton's Les Patiners. Helpman was her most constant partner in the 1930s and 1940s, helping her develop her theatricality. Decades later, Fontaine would name Helpman as her favorite partner across the span of her career. Constant Lambert, as the company music director, assisted with her musicality. Beginning in 1935, Fontaine and Lambert developed a romantic relationship. She had previously been involved with Donald Hodson, the controller of the BBC Overseas Service. Lambert dedicated his score for the Ballet Horoscope 1938 to Fontaine. When the company visited the University of Cambridge for a brief professional engagement in 1937, Fontaine first met Roberto Tito Arias, an 18-year-old law student from Panama, who would later become her husband. Fontaine became enamored with Arias after seeing him perform a rumba dance at a party. The pair enjoyed their time together for the next week. His lack of subsequent communication left Fontaine despondent. By 1939, Fontaine had performed the principal roles in Geisel, Swan Lake, and The Sleeping Beauty, and was appointed as the prima ballerina of the Vic Wells, soon to be renamed the Sadler's Wells Ballet. Her performance in Swan Lake had been a turning point in her career, convincing critics and audiences that a British ballerina could successfully dance the lead role in a full-length classical Russian ballet. The reviewer Arnold Haskell wrote that never before had Fontaine's performance been so regal in manner or half so brilliant, while the writer Tang I Lin commented that she rose to it with a stability that one had not seen in her before. Throughout World War Roman II, the company danced nightly, sometimes also performing matinees to entertain troops. With such a heavy schedule, the dancers were frequently obliged to complete three to four times their usual weekly number of appearances. 
Fontaine later recalled dancing so often that she sometimes stood trembling in the wings, unable to remember if I had finished my solo before I left the stage. Wartime drafts meant that the company lost many of its male dancers to the armed forces. Shows had to be carefully chosen or edited to help ensure that an almost entirely female cast could perform all the roles. Fontaine was often paired with young, inexperienced male dancers pulled straight from ballet schools. With short London seasons, they also traveled abroad and were in the Netherlands when it was invaded in May 1940, escaping back to England with nothing more than the costumes they were wearing. In September 1940, as the London Blitz began, the Sadler's Wells Theatre was turned into an air raid shelter. The company of dancers was temporarily displaced, touring professionally across England. In August 1943, Fontaine took an unexplained sick leave from the company for two months, missing their opening season performances. It was believed by many of her close friends and her biographer, Meredith Daneman, that she underwent an abortion. Her relationship with Lambert had grown difficult, as he was drinking heavily and having affairs with other women. Concerned about her daughter's welfare, Fontaine's mother took matters into her own hands. Fontaine and Hass became lovers, and their close relationship lasted for the next four years. During the war, Ashton created roles such as his bleak wartime piece Dante Sonata 1940 and The Glittery The Wanderer 1941 for Fontaine. She also performed notably in Capelia, imbuing the role with humor. The war years helped her develop stamina and improve her natural talent. In February 1944, he danced the role of the young girl in Le Spectre de la Rose, and was coached by Russian prima ballerina Tamara Karsavina. Covent Garden Years, 1946-1955 In 1946, the company moved to the Royal Opera House at Covent Garden. One of Fontaine's first roles was at a command performance of T. Tchaikovsky's The Sleeping Beauty as Aurora with King George, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary, both Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret, and Prime Minister Clement Attalé in attendance. Initially faced with a costume department severely impacted by post-war rationing, the company had put out a call for every available scrap of silk. In contrast to most Russian dancers, who traditionally learned roles from previous generations of dancers, Fontaine had no such living references readily available to teach her the role of Aurora and was obliged to create her own interpretation. The ballet became a signature production for the company and a distinguishing role for Fontaine, marking her arrival as the brightest crown of the Sadler's Wells Company. Ashton immediately created symphonic variations to capitalize on the success of the opening. Of the six dancers in the production, Fontaine's performance was dubbed brilliant, and Moira Schurer was singled out for her elegance. When the American Ballet Theatre visited the Royal Opera House in 1946, Fontaine became a close friend of the New York dancer Nora Kay. Fontaine appeared on television in 1946 to mark the reopening of Alexandra Palace after the war. Her television appearances were followed by a performance with the choreographer Leonide Massine as the Miller's wife in his The Three-Cornered Hat and as the lead in the abstract debut of Scenes de Ballet which Ashton wrote for her. In 1948, Fontaine went to Paris to perform as a gay, a role created for her in Les Demoiselles de la Nuit by the choreographer Roland Petit. The admiration of Petit gave her new confidence and assurance, which showed in her performance in Ashton's Don Juan, though she was injured on the first night, tearing a ligament in her ankle. She was unable to dance for several months, missing the premiere of Ashton's Cinderella. She recovered sufficiently to dance with Michael Summs in the Christmas presentation of the ballet, 
and made her mark in the role of Cinderella by challenging the traditional costume for act I, replacing the usual brown outfit with a stark black dress and a kerchief tied severely over her hair. Observers commented that Fontaine inserted a new, stronger sense of pathos into the performance. Reprising the role of Aurora in 1949 when the Royal Ballet toured the United States, Fontaine instantly became a celebrity, gaining international recognition. In New York, the American showman Saul Hirock said that the Metropolitan Opera House premiere of Fontaine's Aurora was the most outstanding performance he had ever facilitated, curtain calls lasting half an hour. The New York Herald Tribune called Fontaine unmistakably such a star. London has known this for some time. Europe has found it out, and last night, she definitely conquered another continent. Fontaine was featured on the cover of Time and Newsweek. Upon returning to England, Fontaine danced in George Balanchine's ballet Imperial, for traveling to Italy with Helpman and Pamela May as a guest star in The Sleeping Beauty. In 1949, she profiled choreographies of Sir Frederick Ashton, which were no longer in the repertoire of the Sadler's Wells Company, dancing on television with Michael Summs and Harold Turner. Fontaine appeared in America on The Ed Sullivan Show for the first time in 1951, and would return several times. Her performances were credited with improving the popularity of dance with American audiences. These were followed by two of her most noted roles, as the lead in Ashton's Daphne's and Chloe 1951 and Sylvia 1952. Fontaine was honored as a commander of the Order of the British Empire in 1951 for her contributions to British ballet. Plagued by injury, she considered retiring, especially after her most frequent partner of the 1950s, on an American tour in 1953, Fontaine found herself suddenly requainted with Roberto Tito Arias, whom she had spent time with at Cambridge University in 1937, when he surprised her with a visit to her dressing room after a performance of Sleeping Beauty. Arias was now a politician and Panamanian delegate to the United Nations. Although he already had a wife and children, Arias initiated a courtship with Fontaine and began seeking a divorce with his wife. She returned from the American tour and in the 1954 season debuted in Entrada de Madame Butterfly, later called Entrée Japonaise in Granada, Spain, followed by her first performance as in the title role of the Firebird. She was taught the part by Tamara Karsavina, who had debuted the role in 1910. Fontaine's Firebird was among her greatest achievements for her ability to use her jeeps to simulate flight. Marriage and Politics, 1955-1959 In Paris on 6 February 1955, Fontaine married Arias, adopting the formal married name of Margaret Fontaine de Arias in the Spanish language tradition. In 1955, she returned to the stage and found success in St. Petersburg, dancing the role of Medora in Le Corsair, opposite Rudolf Nureyev. On 12 December 1955, Fontaine appeared with Michael Summs in a live U.S. television color production of T. Tchaikovsky's The Sleeping Beauty for the anthology series Producers Showcase on NBC. The production was underwritten by the Ford Company and ran for an hour and a half, attracting around 30 million viewers. In 1956, she and Sums were guest artists featured in Act Roman II of Swan Lake at the wedding of Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier Roman III of Monaco. The following year, the duo appeared in a producer's showcase production of Cinderella. Fontaine starred with Sums in a 1958 BBC television adaptation of The Nutcracker, which premiered on 21 December. She was successful in two other Ashton ballets, La Perry 1956 and Andine 1958, before becoming a freelance dancer in 1959, 
allowing her to accept the many international engagements she was offered. Shortly before her marriage, Fontaine had been selected to succeed Adeline Jenny as president of the Royal Academy of Dance, and though she protested the appointment, the Academy overruled her decision. Adding planning meetings for a new dance syllabus and attending meetings of the Academy, as her husband had been appointed an ambassador to the court of St. James upon her marriage, Fontaine also attended to the duties required of a diplomat's wife. She was nevertheless criticized for her obvious lack of interest in politics. In 1956, she gave four performances in Johannesburg, South Africa, at His Majesty's Theater and another at Zoo Lake with Michael Summs. Though they received top reviews, she was criticized for performing, despite the dancers' union ban because of apartheid. She was also criticized for performing for Imelda Marcos and was once detained for attending a party at which drugs were used. In April 1959, Fontaine was arrested, detained for 24 hours in a Panamanian jail, and then deported to New York City. Her husband had staged a coup d'etat against President Ernesto de la Guardia, possibly with the support of Fidel Castro. According to Fontaine, the plot was hatched when she and her husband were visiting Cuba in January 1959, with Castro promising to assist areas with arms or men. The couple went fishing on their boat the Nola and during the voyage ordered fishermen to raise a boy loaded with arms. The fishermen reported the couple, who hurriedly decided that areas should try to escape detection. In the night areas jumped ship, warding the shrimp boat Elaine, while Fontaine used her own yacht as a decoy to divert the government forces. She returned to Panama City to turn herself in, hoping her surrender would help her husband. Meeting at the prison with the British ambassador to Panama Sir Ian Henderson, Fontaine confessed her involvement, and the British Foreign Office granted that her statement was confidential. The British Embassy arranged for her release and flew her to New York City on 22 April, without disclosing to the United States government that Cuba had been involved in the plot. Arias took refuge in the Brazilian Embassy of Panama and arrived safely in Lima, Peru, the same day Fontaine arrived in New York. The couple were reunited in June in Rio de Janeiro, and by November she had returned to the stage, dancing with Michael Summs in an Ashton, past to due for a London benefit performance. Fontaine danced in the BBC Eurovision production of The Sleeping Beauty in the title role with Jelko Uresha on 20 December 1959. Nurev years 1961-1979. Fontaine began her greatest artistic partnership at a time when many people, including the head of the Royal Ballet, Ninette de Valois, thought she was about to retire. In 1961, Rudolf Nurev, star of the Kirov Ballet, defected in Paris and was invited by de Valois to join the Royal Ballet. She offered Fontaine the opportunity to dance with him in his debut, and though reluctant because of their 19-year age difference, Fontaine agreed. On 21 February 1962, Nurev and Fontaine performed together in Geisel to an enthusiastic capacity crowd for which they received 15 minutes of applause and 20 curtain calls. The performance was followed by a show-stopping performance of Le Corsair Pass de Dieu on 3 November. The press described their performance as otherworldly, the observer called it a knockout, and the pairing history-making. A few days later, they performed less sylphides to rave reviews, which were carried in United States newspapers. Fontaine was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws from the University of Cambridge in 1962. Sir Frederick Ashton choreographed Marguerite and Armand for them, which no other couple danced until the 21st century. The 1963 premiere was well publicized before its opening and teamed them with Michael Summs, who played the disapproving father. 
composed as a series of pas de dieu interrupted by only one solo the ballet built intensity from the initial coup to fowder to the death scene according to sums the pairing of nurave and fontaine was brilliant as they were not partners but two stars of equal talent who pushed each other to their best performances attended by the queen mother princess margaret and princess marina the production was an immediate success it became a signature work for the duo sealing their partnership in 1964 fontaine and nurave toured from sydney to melbourne performing in jaisal and swan lake with the australian ballet after a brief break they resumed their performances in stuttgart on 8 june that year while the duo were performing in bath they were advised that a rival panamanian politician had shot fontaine's husband arias but it was unclear if he was in imminent danger fontaine though shaken danced in macmillan's new pas de dieu divertimento on 9 june before flying home to panama she found that arias had been shot four times by alfredo jimenez leaving him a quadriplegic for the rest of his life thoughts of retirement receded as she needed to continue working to pay arias medical bills though he was wheelchair bound fontaine who was devoted to his well-being took him with her on most of her travels within 2 weeks she had returned to london having arranged for arias to be treated at the national spinal injuries center of the stoke mandeville hospital and resumed dancing over the next 10 days fontaine danced in six performances of la bayadier jaisal and marguerite and armand while rehearsing nurave's production of raymonda a coma and relapse in arias condition forced her to miss all but the final performance of raymonda in spalito fontaine and nurave were especially noted for their performance of classics such as the sleeping beauty and swan lake which fontaine stripped to the essence of the roles and constantly improved her performance nurave insisted that fontaine partner with him in la bayadier and raymonda and wrote his own version of swan lake for them performed with the vienna state opera ballet in 1964 the performance was filmed and lord snowden took pictures for the 27 november 1964 issue of life on 20 january 1965 fontaine and nurave performed the le corsair pas de dieu at the inaugural ceremonies for president lyndon b johnson in washington DC later that year the couple debuted the title roles in Romeo and Juliet choreographed by Sir Kenneth Macmillan Macmillan had intended the roles to be performed by Lynn Seymour and Christopher Gable but David Webster the manager of the Royal Opera House insisted on Fontaine and Nurave a year after the debut the production was still drawing cues for its nightly performances The audiences littered the duo with flowers demanding repeated curtain calls. Fontaine's depth as an actor made the performance unique, making Juliet one of her most acclaimed roles. Despite differences in background and temperament, she was methodical while he was wildly exuberant, and a 19-year gap in their ages. Fontaine and Nurave became lifelong friends and were famously loyal to each other. Fontaine would not approve an unflattering photograph of Nurave, nor would she dance with other partners in ballets within his repertoire. The extent of their physical relationship remains unclear. Nurave said that they had one, while Fontaine denied it. Her biographer Meredith Dainman said that in spite of no real evidence, her opinion was that they did. Yet Nurave's biographer Diane Solway concluded. that they did not nurave said about her 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 at the end of lack dest signes when she left the stage in her great white tutu i would have followed her to the end of the world in 1965 
Fontaine and Nurev appeared together in the recorded versions Les Sylphides and the Le Corsair Pass de Dieu as part of the documentary An Evening with the Royal Ballet. The film grossed over you son dollar million, creating a record for a dance film at the time, and was shown in over 50 theaters in New York and New Jersey alone over the week of 6 December 1965. Under the guidance of director Paul Seasoner, who used a multi-camera technique to give the feel of a stage performance, they also filmed their famous version of Romeo and Juliet in 1966. That same year, she was awarded an honorary doctorate of music by the Duke of Devonshire upon his installation as the Chancellor of the University of Manchester. In 1967, Roland Petit wrote a new ballet for the duo Paradise Lost. It was an abstract, modern production designed to emphasize Rudolph as a virile Adam and Fontaine as a chic Eve. Pop art decor and flashing neon, the ballet titillated the fans, including Mick Jagger and his girlfriend, the singer Marion Faithful. Fontaine went into semi-retirement in 1972, relinquishing parts in full ballets and limiting herself to only a variety of one-act performances. In 1974, she was awarded the Royal Society of Arts Benjamin Franklin Medal in recognition of her having built bridges between Britain and the U.S. through her art. She ventured into modern dance, performing as Distemona in José Limon the Moors Pavé in June 1975, with the Chicago Ballet followed by a performance of the same dance with Nurave at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., in July. Between the two performances, Fontaine was appearing with the Martha Graham Dance Company in Saratoga, New York City, Athens, and London. After the performance at the Kennedy Center, her tour went on to Brazil. In November 1975, the appearance, though memorable, confirmed that Fontaine was no longer able to execute more demanding roles. In 1976, she published her autobiography, though it was not a tell-all. Her husband was still living and Fontaine was a very private person, as well as proper and fastidious. In 1977, she was awarded the Shakespeare Prize in Hamburg by the Alfred Topfer Stiftung FVS as the first dancer ever honored with the award. Cattle Rancher 1979-1990. Fontaine retired in 1979 at the age of 60, 45 years after becoming the Royal Ballet's prima ballerina. Fontaine and Nurev had created a partnership on and off stage that lasted until her retirement, after which they remained lifelong friends. For her 60th birthday, Fontaine was fated by the Royal Ballet, dancing a duet with Ashton in his Salut Dammer and a tango from Ashton's facade with her former partner, Helpman. At the end of the evening, she was officially pronounced prima ballerina a saluta of the Royal Ballet. She performed with Nurev in his summer season, taking the part of lead nymph in Elapre Midi Dun Fawn by Vaslav Nijinsky and as the girl in Le Spectre de la Rose. Fontaine and Nurev remained close even after she retired to a Panama cattle farm with her husband. The small farmhouse near El Higo, which did not have a telephone, was in a remote village but she stayed in touch, and the two occasionally performed together. Making telephone calls from a neighbor's hotel, Fontaine spoke with Nureyev several times each week. She discovered that she had a real interest in raising cattle and developed a herd of 400 head. In 1979, Fontaine wrote The Magic of Dance, which was aired on the BBC as a television series, in which she starred and was published in book form. The six-part BBC Two series explored aspects in the development of dance from the 17th to the 20th century across the world, including scenes shot on location in Australia, China, France, Monte Carlo, Russia, and the United States. 
It included coverage of a wide range of dancers besides herself and Nurave, including Fred Astaire, Mikhail Baryshnikov. The series caused a stir because up to that time she had not been known for speaking on camera, and after rehearsing what she would say on each segment, she had lived the lines without cue cards. Though some critics failed to grasp that the production was neither a history of dance nor Fontaine's biography, the series was brilliantly successful, and Fontaine received praise from American, Australian, and British critics. That same year, Fontaine also published A Dancer's World, an introduction for parents and students. She danced the role of Lady Capulet in Nurave's Romeo and Juliet with Rudolph and Carla Fracci performing the leading roles in 1981 at the Met in New York City. In 1982, she was made Chancellor of Durham University, which she accepted as a great honor, considering her limited and frequently interrupted education. She traveled to Durham annually to attend the degree ceremony of the graduates and wholeheartedly participated in the duties required until her death. In 1983, she was awarded an honorary doctorate of fine arts from Santa Clara University in the California city of the same name. Fontaine also published Pavlova Portrait of a Dancer in 1984 as a homage to Anna Pavlova, whom she admired. In February 1986, aged 66, she appeared on stage in Miami in a two-night engagement as the Queen in the Sleeping Beauty. Fontaine's last performance with Nureve occurred at the Maritona Festo Court in Mantua, Italy, on 16 September 1988 in Baroque Pass de Troyes, along with ballerina Carla Fracci. In 1989, shortly before the death of her husband, Fontaine was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Having used up all her savings to care for areas in his long infirmity, and now retired without a pension, she dreaded the ordeal. Her stepdaughter, Korub Arias, cared for her and accompanied her to Houston, Texas on her regular trips to M.D. Anderson Hospital. Nurave was one of the few people she told of her problems and he arranged to visit her regularly in Houston, despite his busy schedule as a performer and choreographer. By 1990, she had undergone three operations and was bedridden. Out of money, Fontaine began to sell her jewelry to pay for her care, and Nurave anonymously helped to pay the bills. In February 1990, the Public Broadcasting Service aired the Margaret Fontaine story as part of its series Great Performances. In the documentary, Nurave said that they danced with one body, one soul. Fontaine's biographer, Daneman, said their uncanny bond of empathy went beyond the understanding most people have for each other. Most people are on level A. They were on level Z. In May, a gala was held at Covent Gardens to raise money for her care. Placido Domingo volunteered to sing and both Sums and Nurave danced. The event was attended by more than 2,000 guests, including Princess Margaret, Diana, Princess of Wales, and Dame Ninette de Valois, Death and Legacy. Shortly before her death, Fontaine converted to Roman Catholicism so that she could have her ashes buried in the same tomb as Arias. As her health worsened, she received a regular flood of messages and flowers from well-wishers, including Queen Elizabeth Roman II and the President of Panama. Fontaine died on 21 February 1991 in a hospital in Panama City, aged 71, on the 29th anniversary of her premiere with Nurave in Gisel. She was buried with areas near their home in Panama and a memorial service was held in London on 2 July 1991 at Westminster Abbey. A grief-stricken Nurave, who was dealing with his own health issues in the form of AIDS, was unable to attend either service. In her hometown of Regate, a statue created by British sculptor Nathan David FRBS in 1980 stands in tribute to Fontaine.
depicting her in her favorite role of Andine. The statue was commissioned by fans worldwide. The main hall in Dunelm House, the student union building at the University of Durham, is named the Fontaine Ballroom in her honor, as is the foyer to the Great Hall of University College, Durham, in Durham Castle. In 2005, Margaret's Closet, a dancing apparel and accessory shop, named in homage to Fontaine, opened in Marietta, Georgia, an Atlanta suburb. The Margaret Fontaine Academy of Ballet, established in Peekskill, New York, in 2007, is named in her honor. In the early 1990s, the fossil plant Williamsonia Margotiana was named after Fontaine. She was one of five women of achievement selected for a set of British stamps issued in August 1996. In the 1998 film Hillary and Jackie about British cellist Jacqueline Dupree, Fontaine is portrayed in a cameo appearance by Nairi Dawn Porter. In 2005, Tony Palmer made a documentary for ITV about Fontaine titled Simply Margaret. It includes interviews with several colleagues from the dance world, New Rave's personal assistant, and Fontaine's sister-in-law, Phoebe Fontaine. The BBC made a film about Fontaine, broadcast on 30 November 2009, based on Daneman's biography and starring Anne-Marie Duff as the ballerina. In 2016, the English Heritage Trust installed a blue plaque on the building, where Fontaine lived when she was performing with the Sadler's Wells Ballet. To mark the 100th anniversary of her birth, the Theatre and Film Guild installed a commemorative blue plaque to Fontaine at her childhood home at 3 Elm Grove Road, Ealing. Premiering Roles